Hi, welcome to the channel. In this comprehensive tutorial of Pandas, I'm going to cover the top 10 topics you need to know about the library in order to be efficient with it. We'll start with simple topics such as reading data in Pandas from multiple file formats. How do you read, let's say, a list of CSV files and concatenate them? Then I'll be explaining how you can do simple operations such as selecting columns, filtering rows, sorting data frames and updating columns based on conditions. And then we'll move on to more complex topics such as grouping by, doing value counts, working with time series data, doing some simple data visualization with pandas. And finally, we'll be covering reshaping data. That's a really important skill you need to have in order to do data manipulation efficiently. So yeah, let's get started with the course. Here I have some imports. I defined this option for pandas. Here I'm defining a string that points to where I have the data we'll be using. So if you go to my uh, GitHub repository, Martin Bell uh, bar datasets, so we have a bunch of CSV files and parquet files you can use to learn data science. So what I'll be doing is reading some of these uh, files. Let's get started with the first one. So this is an um, a sharks attacks data set. It's a very fun data set to use. Um, so in pandas, we can just pass uh, this string um, the same way we would if it were in our computer in the file system. So I can do pd.readcsv and then pass this string that points to the attacks.csv file. Um, okay, so let's try it. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we get an error. So um, what's going on? Okay, UTF code can decode byte, blah, 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 in position, whatever. What happens here is that the encoding of the file, which means how the data is stored, um, is not UTF-8, that's the popular encoding. So what happens if we Google this? Um, or, I mean, we could ask ChatGPT, but I think it's just easier to Google it. So we get a lot of uh, answers here. Seems a bit messy. Um, but the reality is that this is a good try in general when this happens. So this is a kind of Windows encoding. So uh, let's try it and see what happens. So I just pass uh, encoding equals uh, the CP1252. And OK, now we can uh, read the file. So file has a bunch of missing values, it seems. So we just need to be careful with that. Um, I'm just going to call it DF sharks. And then we can take a look at the top rows. And this has um, kind of a date, a year, um, the country where the shark attack happened and the name of the person, the gender, some details. I mean, it's kind of a fun data set to uh, analyze. Um, generally, what happens is if you if you take a look at the, the types of attacks, uh, generally the people that provoked the sharks were, were the ones that were attacked. So this data set is a way to prove that sharks are not dangerous by themselves. Uh, yeah, this is a reading a file, CSV file, with a relatively uncommon encoding. Uh, you have to be careful with that. But I mean, if you go through this uh, Stack Overflow forum, you generally find some ideas you can try. Uh, but yeah, generally, this is a very common encoding also. So then uh, what I want to show you is how you can read some parquet file. So you see this uh, spike lows adjusted dot parquet file. So this is a different file format that uses less space. And if I concatenate these two strings, we, we create this uh, same thing here. So let's call this docs. docs. And pd.read parquet. OK, um, so this has um, close adjusted information of 500 stocks that are the components of the S&P 500. So it's a very popular stock index. For example, we could um, do stocks.info. And this would give us some more information of the, yeah, the data, right? So there are 512 columns. Um, 
4597 rows and it tells us the yeah the date range of the data um, so for example we could uh, select some of the columns just by passing them we'll do that later so next i want to read this file that's uh, another parquet file and we'll do it the same way so it will be um page views equals pd read parquet and we'll just copy in this string and we can do a head also okay it's taking a little bit more time because this is a larger data set here we have some sort of timestamp page number and some other ids and a user id okay so these are um yeah records that represent visits to a website and let's see how many rows we have here Okay, 5 million, blah, blah, blah. So one one way, uh, yeah, if this were a CSV file, we could have read it with uh, another in another way that makes it faster. Um, I'll show it to you in a second. So this is uh, fine for now. So we have covered these two, um, read CSV, read per cat. Let's take a look at the other uh, functions that are common methods. So I'll use the sharks data set um let's see what info tells us um okay so now as we have yeah 24 columns it prints out the data types the column name and the d type of each column so what does this mean so um we have the column name here that's clear then we have the number of not no uh, observations so uh we can see that if this has 8700 and the yeah there are twenty five thousand rows um so it seems that like there are like a lot of missing values for some reason so it might be an issue with how the data was saved so that's something we should be careful with and then we have the d type that's the data type of the column so object means um yeah kind of like a character let's say um so that there are other ways to represent string data in pandas but object is the default and then we have float and we would generally also have a, a integer so basically this is what the dot info tells us some information of the data frame we can also do um, uh, the uh, sharks dot d types so and this tells us practically the same thing that's here but it's something we can filter with, right? It's we could filter, uh, yeah, columns that are float. If we wanted to select the float columns, we could do dot select d types, and we can do float before, and this will help us select the columns that are, uh, yeah, floats in this case, or at least encoded as floats. The year should be integer. So there's one more example I want to show you how you can read multiple CSV files. I've written this code snippet here. Um, so we have two files that I have locally in my machine. These are a little bit larger, so they are not in GitHub. And what I'm doing here is I'm looping through these files, uh, just printing that I'm reading the file, and then I'm reading the CSV file. So one thing I'm doing here is engine equals by arrow and it to read the CSV file a little bit faster. It's uh, implemented recently, but it doesn't always work. So you have to just try it, see if it works with your data and if it works, great. Um, so after reading this, the, the CSV file, I'm appending it to the data list. This approach generally works. The problem is that your this data list is growing in size and when i concatenate it it's basically reproducing the memory size so if you have a really large data set you have to be careful uh, because it might use more uh, memory than usual so so now i have this uh, list so let me show it to you for example i can select the, the first element and then i can select the second element the list so what we'll be doing now is just concatenate these these two files. Um, I can call this EF uh, Airlines, um, and basically 
this will have both data frames that we just read. So this has, um, yeah, almost 10 million rows. So not a tiny data set. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is a kind of very common thing we need to do in pandas or in any other uh, data manipulation library. We need to read multiple CSV files or whatever it, file format and concatenate it in one data set. Okay, let's continue with selecting columns. How can we select columns here? So we can create a, a list of columns uh, and just uh, re write them down here, month, um, day of uh, month, let's say. So we could actually create a date with this, um, yeah, with these three fields. And yeah, so the way I'm, I'm selecting columns, just passing the list here. So, um, and for some reason it didn't work. Okay, let's see. Day of month. Okay, so this is lowercase. Um, okay, so yeah, generally I would suggest that you convert all the columns to lowercase because yeah, it's really annoying to have to keep track of the, yeah, this, the case people used. Um, so this is the way to select columns. You just, uh, you can create a list in, in another line and then uh, pass it here, or you can do it together. You could do this also. So let me show you. So you could do this. Um, a lot of people do this. I find that it's not as clean as setting the list uh, beforehand, but it's useful for exploratory data analysis. Um, okay, so another way you can select columns is using DF lock. Let me show you how this works. So we have DF airlines here. So DF lock, what it allows you to do is to filter rows and column at the columns at the same time. So basically it's, it's very useful for quick exploration of the data. So let's say you want to have, um, data of year 2007. So I could do DF year equals 2007 and bring me uh, the, these columns, keep columns, keep calls that we define. So, um, okay, DF RLS and DF here. So, okay, so this is the way you just select a column here and define a condition, a Boolean condition, and here you define the columns that you want to keep. And this is a very handy approach, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I like to do things step by step. And but yeah, this is this is useful. It's very useful. So another way you could um, you could do this is do it using the method chaining. Let me show you how that works. So we could do this. We can just create some parentheses and then we can do uh, dot lock here. Um, just select all the rows um, and then we could filter the columns that we want. So um, here I'm filtering uh, using this Boolean condition, DF airlines dot year, and then I'm keeping the rows that I want. Um, I mean, this has the same result. It's a little bit less efficient because um, yeah, we're, we're getting all the data here and then we're filtering the columns. So generally you want to filter the columns first. Um, so that you could actually just move this here. I think this is um, this way, this approach, this method chaining is a lot more intuitive to work with data interactively. So this is more compact, this approach, but um, maybe it's harder to read for some people. So I think this is very good to learn. And when you pass in these parentheses on the sides, um, you can just write each uh, operation that you're doing uh, at a different line. So um, I think that's very handy for, uh, yeah, for using pandas. Okay, so let's continue. Let's discuss filtering rows. We we'll already did a little bit of that, but um, let's do it again. So I'll use the sharks data set here. So df sharks .head. Um Okay, so here we have some information of the people that were uh, attacked by sharks. 
Um, so let's say I want to filter uh, data with a given age, for example. We can print uh, the D types, see if they are in the right D type. So um, age, it's an object. Okay, maybe let's just use sex, that should be fine. Okay, so Boolean indexing. So DF sharks, and we can do the same thing we did before, use um, dot, dot sex equals uh, family. And this didn't work. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, okay, so there's a space here in sex. So maybe we can do str um, strip and that we can, that way we can clean up the column names. Um, yeah, and maybe we can just make it lowercase uh, str.lower and let's run this again here. It's headed. Okay, um, so now we have all the columns in lowercase. So um, basically, I first do a str.strip call that removes the, the, yeah, the, the white space on the sides of the string. And then I convert all the column names to lowercase. So now we can do uh, sex and this should work. Okay, so we basically have all the female uh, shark attacks here. Um, and another way you can do this is using the F query. So let me show you how you can convert this, um, this to using the F query. I'll use the method chaining idea. So the F sharks dot query, and we can use the same thing we did here. We just create a string, but the, the nice thing is that we don't have to keep repeating the data frame. So sex equals female. And uh, let's say, um, and country equals USA. So, um, so let's see if there were some Argentinians attacked. So no. So basically, why is this nice? Because we can pass in one uh, expression, multiple conditions very easily. And we have to keep repeating the F sharks. So let me show you how this would have worked if I have done it uh, in this approach. So basically, I have to do the same thing that we have here, but I have to wrap it with parentheses. Then I pass the operator, the AND operator in this case, and then I use this condition here, but I need to repeat the data frame. So if you compare the query version to this version here, um, I mean, this is, yeah, it's more redundant. You have to repeat this a uh, few times. You have these parentheses. It's, uh, yeah, it's more work. Whereas the query um, version, as it's a string, you could, you could pass variables to it. For example, um, let's say we, we can do keep countries. And let's say we, let's see how, which countries are there. So we have sharks dot uh, country value count. Um, okay, so we have Australia, which makes sense. And so let's say USA and Australia. So I create a list with the countries I want to keep information. And instead of passing it as a string here, I can do at and then just pass the list. So now we can filter by um yeah more than one value and this is something you could do here but it's yeah it's not very very convenient so i think this query method is a great uh trick to know um okay so let's continue so another um interesting concept is this uh contains idea to filter strings. So basically you can pass an expression to the to a column of the data frame um, that's, that helps you filter some string. So let's see an example. And, and um, okay, let's say we want to uh, filter the people's name. And let's do this, um, name dot str contains. 
And here we could pass a string, for example. Um, so I could pass uh, a wall. And okay, <laughs> cannot mask. Okay, so we have some NAs here. So we need to pass NA equals uh, false. So uh, that's just to say that, okay, missing values are false. We don't want to keep them. Um, so here I'm, I'm filtering the, the, the name column to match for wall. And let's say wolf kind of uh, seems like a popular last name. So it's matching here, wolf and Wolfgang. But if you, if you can see this, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't matter where it finds the string. Um, it, here it's finding it in the middle. Here it's finding it in the start. Here in the in the middle. Here we're also in the middle. So you could, for example, um, look for the names that starts with wolf. So so you can pass this symbol. And then regex equals true. And now it shows you the the strings that starts with wolf, which of course Wolfgang uh, appears. And, but you could, it could be a letter, for example. And, and this is the, the power of regular expressions. If you want to learn more how you can use this, you can go to this documentation page um, that explains how you can, the, the parameters you can pass here. So, for example, the case, um, you can ask it not to be case sensitive. So, by default, it's case sensitive. So, maybe. In practical terms, I, I rather prefer case equals false. So now it doesn't matter if it's W uh, uppercase or not. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's lowercase or uppercase, it will just match it. So let me show you an example. So if I pass the lowercase W wolf, it matches the uppercase also. So if I put uh, true here, it won't find anything because there aren't examples where it starts with lowercase. Okay. Um, okay. So this is another way to filter data using regular expressions. Uh, it's very useful. Um, yeah, I think you, you need to know at least the basics. Okay. So let's continue. Now we have the sort data frame. So let's take a look at the um, airlines. So airlines. Um, okay. So we have um, the columns here have arrival delay and so let's let's take a look at this um, data set and maybe sort it so df airlines um, sort values and i pass the column and i pass the standing equals false so i just want the larger values in the top so i ask for the top 10 values and it will sort, sort this data frame that's really large and show me the top 10 uh, values. And here we have some information of when this happened, the, yeah, the flight number, some information of the airports, I would assume, origin, destination. So, uh, yeah, uh, and you could, for example, uh, look for the top 10 largest uh, flights. So we have the distance column here. So let's try that. So I do the same thing. So DF airlines sort values by distance. Uh, yeah. Then I do dot head 10 because I want to see the top 10 results. So these are the longest flights. Um, okay. Distance 4,900. Um, so I don't know what, what these are, but probably some really long flight. And, and yeah, that's, that's the power of sorting. I mean, generally what you would do is group by some data, do some calculation and then sort it. But um, yeah, I think this is a very important thing to know how to do. Okay, let's continue. So now I'm going to show you how you can update a column based on a condition. So, so DF charts, let's take a look at this. Let's select three rows. Um, so we want to update a column, right? So let's try, um, yeah, converting all the names to lowercase. Let's say we want to do that. Um, okay, so df sharks um, dot name. So I select the name column, and now I want to convert str 
lowercase. With strings, you first need to do dot str, and then you can use functions. So here I'm using the lowercase method. So in order to update a column, we need to use this syntax. So I can't use the dot syntax. So, so I just pass the, the uh, brackets and the name as a string. And now it converts it to lowercase. So let me show you here. OK, so we can see the, the column got updated. OK, and and you could do any operation here. I just choose an example. But um, yeah, this is um, yeah. Now I'll create another column with a constant. So OK, so let's uh, dump it and one, two, three. If I run the head again, so we'll have at the end this one, two, three values in the dummy column. So now I want to delete a column. So the way uh, there are a few ways to do this, right? But one way is to do del and then pass the column name. But the reality is that's kind of not very practical, in my opinion. It, it's, it's not the best approach. So there's another way I'll create it again. So have it here and another way to do it is uh, df shorts so the data frame drop and i pass the the columns here so we only have one dummy and this will drop the column so it's not here anymore and what we need to do then is assign it to the data frame because otherwise it won't be updated. Okay, um, so there we have it. Uh, so we could actually remove these columns also. Um, let me show you how to do that. So we have sharks, columns, so I'm named 22 and I'm named 23. <laughs> Not very useful. Um, let's see how we can do this. So we have shark, drop, columns, and now we can pass a list of the columns we want to, to drop. Um, let's see if it works. Add equals two. Okay, so they are not there. And so then I just remove the head and I can assign it to, um, to the data frame. So yeah, generally, if you're doing this, you want to put um, all the code that you use to read the file and manipulate it in a function. So you do all the pre-processing and it's all in one place. So now if I run these the F short columns, the these columns that we removed aren't there. Okay, so another way you can up update columns is using assign. So uh, let me show you what, what I mean. So if you want to read the documentation, you can open it here. Let me show you. Um, and basically, it's not really very descriptive in the, in this part. Uh, I think they need to expand it a little bit, but they have a few examples that show how you can use it. So I think this is the one that's the most important one. So they have, um, they use, let me just copy this to the notebook. Um, so basically what, what they have here is um, df.assign and they created a column right and the way to to do it is using a lambda function but uh and yeah and this allows you to create multiple columns i mean this is an approach uh, that's becoming a lot more popular now and i think it's it's good if you if you know about it um okay so let's take a look at how we can do this uh with some of the data sets we have so yeah let's try the stocks data set um and i'll select one one stock here, uh, Amazon. So to frame, so I just I want a data frame, not a, a series. Um, okay, so here we have Amazon. I want to use a sign to do a bunch of calculations. So, um, so let me see. So we, here you can see the syntax that I'll be using. Okay. Um, so, so Amazon dot um yeah let's try this this uh, method chaining idea dot sign and here i can pass a bunch of operations so i could do for example um 
uh, I can do Amazon Red Returns. What does this mean? This means that the percent change of the prices. So the, the idea is that I'll be taking this price and divide it by this one and subtract minus one. So I can measure how much the prices change at each day. So, so this will be the equivalent of this uh, temporal function. So then I have this lambda x. So equals to lambda x. And now it's what I'll be doing with the yeah with the calculation. So x, uh, I'll select Amazon, right? Amazon, and I'll do percent change. And that's basically all we need to do to compute the percent change. So um, I can do a head here at the end, so we can print everything. So let me show you what's going on here. So this value is basically 2.10 divided by 2.22 minus 1. And the next value here um, is 2.08 divided by 2.10 minus 1. So what I'm doing is I'm computing the percent change compared to the previous value. And the nice thing of um, this uh, method is, uh, if you if you look at this example, they are using this temporal func temporal column they created here. So I guess we could do something similar. Okay, so the idea now would be to use this uh, intermediate column that we created, Amazon returns, and see how we can use it to compute something else. So first comma, and Amazon cumulative returns and this is the column that we will be creating so i do lambda x dot so um x two points and now i can access the this this column here so x dot amazon returns and what i'll be doing is what's called uh yeah assume you invest one dollar in this stock how much money would you have as time goes by so this is what we're doing so one plus the returns dot cum prod um so this is the the kind of uh yeah calculation that you can do because you've done it here so um okay this is the assign call let's see how this works okay looks like it's correct um so feel uh so so now we have these missing values we could drop them for example so let me show you how that would work so i can do dot drop na and that's it. So that's this is kind of a good example uh, how this method chaining logics work because we started with this idea, then we decided to drop missing values, and it's very intuitive. So now I could, uh, for example, uh, select this cumulative returns uh, variable and then plot it. Okay, so this is the um, yeah the the idea of you investing one dollar in Apple in 2005, and how much you would have in 2024. So, um, so we could do everything to the, together, the data manipulation and plotting. But I think it's better practice to separate between two, the two things. Um, so here we have these uh, returns. So I can assign this to Amazon uh, returns to a new uh, data frame. Okay. Perfect. So, um, yeah, uh, this is in the context of finance, this is called returns. So basically the percent change, but in any other context is simply the rate of variation between two amounts. Okay. Um, so one more thing we, we should cover is how you can update column using a regex, a regular expression. So let's go and take a look at the documentation. Um, so, and yeah, you can read everything that's possible here. There are a few examples below. Um, let's take a look. So, um, so basically here they pass a, a regular expression, they pass a new value they want to replace and say regex equals true. So let's, let's copy this example and see if we can use it with uh, one of the data sets. So we have sharks. Um, I'm using this data set because it has a lot of uh, text uh, columns. So, uh, let's say we want to replace wolf by something else. Um, okay, this is the example of the documentation. Uh, so let's take a look. DF sharks dot um, 
name and we want to maybe do it like this because we have yeah more than one uh, operation here replace and we just need to pass something the pattern that you want to find so in our case it's a wolf and we want to uh, replace it with uh, nothing with empty string and we want this to be a regex and I'll replace the ones that start with wolf okay so um, let me first look at the examples that we find with this regular expression so uh, bf sharks dot uh, bf sharks str contains so this is what we did before and we pass the this regex here enables false and regex equals true um, okay so let's take a look uh, the F sharks name. Okay, so these are the instances where we find wolf, right? And what I'm trying to do here is to find this wolf and replace it with an empty string. So, okay, there it goes. So, um, yeah, basically this is how you would do it. Um, let's see if we can replace it here. Replace the name column. And now we can go back and and look for these observations so um so they are not there but i think what we'll find is the gang uh name so removing wolf means that the name is gang now and basically these are two useful operations that you need to know how you can find patterns in the data using a string or a regular expression and how you can update patterns using a regular expression. So for updating patterns, you can use the replace uh, method. Okay. So let's continue. So now we have um, a little bit more um, typical data analysis uh, concept. So we have value counts group by. So the first step would be to do uh, some value counts that I think it's a really popular, uh, very common operation that you do all the time. So let's take a look at this page views uh, data set. Um, okay, so we have, um, yeah, let, let's take a look at this, um, how many uh, times, how many visits each page, each, each page receives. So uh, I can do page views and dot value counts and I select the page column and this is basically these are basically the results so um i mean there are too many right so how many are there let's say uh yeah 1508 so maybe um maybe here we have less values content category okay 64 maybe this is easier to take a look at and so maybe after doing this you want to take a look at the top 10 so uh, and largest 10 and here you have a little bit more useful information so what will happen if i change page here back okay we have the top 10 pages okay and you could actually plot this if you wanted to so plot uh kind equals bar so there you have a bar chart with the top pages from the data okay um so what happens if you use more than uh, one variable in value counts so let's take a look let's take a look at that okay here is the the data um so now i want to understand pages the the interaction between pages and content category so i want to do page views dot value counts and i'll just pass these two variables here Okay, and we get something similar, but uh, we have now a hierarchical index. So let's do reset index. Okay, and this is what we get. We get the page, the content category, and we get this zero column that, yeah, we need to convert to something more human comprehensible. 
Uh, but this is how you can use value counts with more than one variable. So another way to do this is using um, yeah, the size method. So let me show you how that works. So, so here we have these page views. And I can do a group by. So I just pass these uh, two variables and then dot size. So, and surprisingly, this does something relatively similar. The difference is that we are using group by. The reality is that even though value counts is nice for a quick, you know, uh, count of one variable, I think it's nice that you can do everything with group by because you just need to learn one kind of API. Okay, so I generally prefer this approach, but this is also possible. Uh, as usual in pandas, there are multiple ways to do things, so you kind of need to learn what, uh, yeah, what you want. Okay, so I'm just going to do one more example of group by. So for this, I'm going to read the diamonds dataset. So this basically has information of diamonds. So the idea is to do a group by with this data. So we have a bunch of categorical variables. So let's pick clarity and let's do diamonds dot group by. So I could basically start using this method chaining syntax also. I do diamonds dot group by and I pass the, the variable name and then I can do let's say uh, mean I can take the mean of price here we have the average of each clarity this is a nice idea I mean you can you do things kind of line by line so if you wanted to do other aggregations you could use the dot ag so dot ag and then just pass the string with the function you want, so the average and the standard deviation. So I just create the list with the, the functions that I want to use. And yeah, it computes them. So this is nice because you have the average, then you have the variability of each, um, at, of, at each group of the categorical variable you're grouping by. But yeah, in some cases you want to have more control. And if you, the, the disadvantage of this approach is that you're only using the price variable. So there's one more way to do this. Start with the data frame, we do group by uh, clarity. And now we can do uh, dot act. And here I can pass the, yeah, let's say I want the average price. And I can do this like this. So um, I pass the price column and I pass the mean the function that I want to apply. So, and that, that works. The, the nice thing here is that I define the column name here on my own. So it's not done automatically using the function name as before. And I can use other, uh, other columns in the same group by. So I could do a, a group by, by carrot, for example. So carrot is the weight. So average carrot equals uh, carrot. And I can do the mean also. Okay, so now we can aggregate multiple columns in one expression, in one group by, okay? So, um, okay, how can we make this a little bit more interesting? So we could also add one more column to the group by. So let's say I have clarity here, but I want to use, let's say, the cut. Okay, so... What this creates is a multi-index on the rows and we have the same columns as before. So I think this is interesting also. I mean, it's a little bit harder to, to manipulate. Maybe clarity has a lot of values, but let's say you could put color here and it might be easier to, to understand. Um, but, but yeah, basically this is the, the idea. You can group by for more than one column. So if, if you don't want the index, um, you can do reset index here. It just gives you back a normal data frame or you can pass, uh, I think as, as index equals false here. And you get the same result. So uh, if you don't like the multi index, I personally don't like them much. Um, so you can just get a data frame. Okay. Um, so this is a kind of quick overview of the group by. So let's take a look at the transform now. So um, 
So how does transform work? So I'll start with this similar example here. Um, so I'll just do the mean. So this is the average price of each clarity. Okay. So what if I want to create a column with this, with each of these values that matches the, the clarity value? So uh, let me show you what I mean. So here, um, so let's say this is S uh, I two. So I want another column that maps this value. So 5,063. So one way to do this is using transform. So we, we grab the same thing we had here. Um, we select the price column also, and then we do dot transform. So basically what this does is expand the mean of each uh, clarity value. So it, it can match the clarity value that we have in the data frame. So, um, so let's the amount, um, clarity average price. Um, so I'll just call the new column clarity price. And this is, um, so we first do a group by, then we select the column and then we call transform passing the mean. So let's take a look at the head here. What happened here is that the average that we computed for each clarity value got added to the data frame. And that's really all that's, uh, there is to it to transform. It's useful because let's say you want to, um, compare the price to the average given a variable, you, you can do it this way. Okay. So now we'll continue working with time series data in Panda. So I have some stocks data here. So this goes from 2005 to 2023. Um, I mean, we could just plot this, for example, the plot, and that's a really quick way to plot data, um, uh, in pandas. Um, so we can also change the, the axis to make it logarithm scale. Uh, so we can do log Y equals, uh, true. And this makes the Y axis to be in logarithm scale. So we can see a little bit better when there's a, yeah, a, a large drop, for example, here in the, yeah, the financial crisis in 2008. So what I want to do next is to filter the data so we can zoom in to these rows. So this is what I have done here. So we define the starting date to two points and then the end date. And if I run this and then plot it, we get um, kind of zooming into this big drop. And I mean, in, for a relatively short amount of time, we don't really need the logarithm axis. But if you have a, a large time series, it's very useful. So here we can see that the prices dropped to around 2.5 and they were, yeah, let's say 5.5 more or less around here. So how much is that? So how can I measure that? So 2.5 divided 5.5 minus one. So this was a 54% per drop. So not, not a very nice experience to be invested during this time. Um, and this is one of the stocks that did really well. So, okay, here I have some, um, here I have an example of missing values in Panda. So I just added some NA values here to this, uh, price data. And the idea is to see how we can fill them. So you could fill them with the mean or with, uh, just a fixed value. So let's say I want to just take the average here. So I do mean, and then I can do, uh, X dot fill an a and just pass the average. Okay. So this will fill in with the average, but the problem is if you have a relatively large time series, the average might not be the best way to do it. So let me remove this here. And another way to do it is using the F fill method. So what's going on here. So here we have the original time series, and this is the, the series I filled in the values. So what we're using is the previous value to fill in the NAs. And this is, this makes a lot of sense with financial data, because when we're at the, at the point where filling this missing value, we won't have this price because that didn't happen yet. Um, so the best we can do is just 
move the last observation we have forward. So the most recent observation that we have. Um, so let's say you, you are in this day, right? And you want to filter the missing value. So you look back and, okay, what is the, the first non-missing value that I have? So that's what's going on here. And it's very, it's a very common approach in time series. So here I'm going to copy it so you can see it better. So X dot fill an A and you define the method that you want to fill it. So if you take a look at the documentation, there are, uh, yeah, a bunch of, uh, methods that you can use. So backfill, befill, pad, etc. Um, okay. So let's continue. So one more thing that it's very useful in time series is resampling. So before we had daily data, so let me take a, let me show you what we have. So this is daily data. So we have one observation per day. And what I'm doing here is, um, resampling the data to be at the monthly level. So we have one observation for each month and I'm using the last day of the month to represent the, the data. So I could, I could do MS and that would be, that would change this index to be start of the month. In some cases, this might be cleaner, but it, it's very often useful to just leave the last day of the month because it's clearer what you're doing. So basically what we do is just grab the data frame, pass resample, define the, the frequency of the data. And here we have the kind of operation that we want to do. So I'm just choosing last here, but it could be mean, for example, could be median and, and we could plot this also. So, so now we'll, we'll be plotting monthly data. So we have a lot less, uh, yeah, weekly in the data. So here I could change this to quarterly, for example, and maybe I, I'll keep the last value. Because in finance, you the last value is the best representation of that period. So let's go back to monthly. And this is how it looks. So we have the same thing of the Y axis here. So I can do log Y equals true. And yeah, it, it looks relatively similar to the daily data. But I mean, it, there's less noise here. So we just have one observation per month. So that's why it's useful. Um, okay, so let's continue. So one thing you can do also in, in, in general with time series is shift a column and then you can compute the percent change, for example. So let's say we have these time series here, um, the last 10 observations of this data. And shifting a column would mean that I uh, basically move this column one uh, observation down. So the effect of that is that I can compare the previous observation of the data very easily. So, so if this is the current observation, this one is the previous observation. So you can, you can see it here in the Apple column, right? So, so I basically move this value to the T minus one column, and then we can compute the percent change. That's, um, Apple divided T minus one and and that gives me this column. So uh, just to give you an example, this is what's going on. So uh, let's say um, 160 divided um, 157.64 minus one. So this division uh, is here. So 019791. And, and you can think of it as, uh, yeah, that you're dividing this value Compare, you compare it to the previous value. So it's the rate of change also. Um, in finance, this is called daily returns or returns depending on the time frequency you're using. Okay, and there's one uh, simpler way to do this in Pandas that's using the percent change method. So this does the same thing, but you basically don't have to create a lag of the column and then do the division, it just does both of these operations in one. So it's a lot better. I mean, but I think it's important that you learn how to do it with shift because in some cases, in, if you use other libraries, maybe it's not available, this function, and you won't know how to do it. Okay, so here I have exam an example where I'm selecting 
uh, three stocks, so Apple, Microsoft, and Google. Okay, I'm going to run this again. So one thing you can do is compute the percent change of all these stocks. So the nice thing of the data frame is, is that you can pass the, this percent change uh, method to the data frame and it, it applies this function to all the columns. So you don't have to, uh, yeah, just do it column by column. <coughs> okay, so here I have the plotting section, right? So if you go to pandas.plot, the documentation, um, so have it here, um, you, you can find a lot of options that allow you to plot data from a data frame or from a column of the data frame. But this is a data frame method, right? And you have a lot of options. Here are the, the kind of plots that you can you can do. Um, you can decide if you want subplots or not. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. And here you can uh, define if you want to share the axis or not. And that's very useful also. So, um, so here I have some stocks information right um so let me remove this um so here i have some returns information so we we did this calculation before um basically just selecting these three stocks and what i like to do now is to plot this information so um let's let's start with this example so so here i'm resampling the data to be monthly and I'm keeping the last observation. Okay, so now I have um, prices. Okay, and they are at the monthly level. So I can call percent change here, and this will give me the returns at the monthly level. So I'm comparing this month compared to the previous month. Okay, and now I could just do dot plot. And what this would do is just plot all the time series in one chart, uh, which, I mean, it's not terrible, but uh, it also adds a lesson here, but it's very hard to, to see anything here. So I can change the, the kind of plot and make it a bar chart. Let's see if this works. Um, okay, <laughs> so it seems that the axis kind of blew up this chart looks better but it's still not yeah not great so how else can i can i visualize this data so let's go back to the documentation and take a look at the options so here i have the kind plot so i'm going to choose the histogram so just need to pass hist so kind equals hist um, and this plots a histogram uh, of the three stocks returns in one plot and okay, so one thing I might be interested in doing is just plotting each histogram in a subplot. So I can go here, subplots, and just pass through. And okay, and that works. Uh, so we have a histogram, and in each uh, subplot, maybe we can change the beans here to be a bit more. And yeah, this is already a relatively decent plot. The nice thing is we started from the raw data, so the, the stock prices, and go to the plot in literally five lines of code. So this is very useful. And I think it's one of the main ideas that I see a lot of people uh, picking up now with pandas that using this method chaining syntax. So, um, and you can here go back and change the kind of plot. So KDE, for example, um, so this will be a kernel density. Uh, okay, I we don't need the bins argument. Okay, so um, this is also interesting. So what else can we do? Uh, bar. So let's see if we can do a, a bar chart now. Um, might not work very well, but maybe it's better than plotting everything together. So the labels are awful, but but this is actually a lot better so we just need to fix this but i mean for a kind of exploratory analysis um this is fine i mean it it hurts a little bit to, to see these uh lesions but whatever um 
So, and yeah, the line is the, the default plot, right? Um, and yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't find this very useful. I think the histogram is the best one um, because you can compare the distributions of each of the returns. Um, and yeah, the, basically what we're looking at here is we have a, a return distribution, basically the, how much the stocks change every month. And so here we have a centered in a little bit more than zero for most of these stocks. And between zero and zero, uh, yeah, zero five. So between zero and 5%, which is nice. I mean, each month stocks go up between zero and 1%, but there were a few months um, this month. It, yeah, it was like 30% down. So um, yeah, I mean, not all the months are positive. So we have a distribution. Let's continue with reshaping data. So here I have um, some data of um yeah it's just uh, multiple countries some um basically has a lot of uh, kind of economic and social development data but what i want to show with this data is how you can go from this format that it's called a white format so you have a bunch of columns that should be rows here uh, how can you go from these to uh more a cleaner version of the data that's put in long format so first i'm going to read these values as missing values so na uh, values so let's see if this works okay so at least i'm reading this as missing values and what i need to do is use the melt function so just going to do a head of two values so let me show you the documentation of melt. So go here and that's melt. Um, so and here, these are the, the arguments that we need to define. So some are optional, some are um, mandatory. So ID bars is one of the ones you have to define. And basically what ID bars are, are the, the variables that you want to keep as they are in the data. So they are the identifiers. So let's do the F dot melt. So ID bars. And here we, we need to pass these the, the first columns on the data. Um, so let me just print these columns. We have columns. Um, I think six. Okay. Good. Um, just create it, define it as a list. Okay, so let's let's pass it here. And what else do we need to pass to melt? So value bars. So these are uh, the values that you want to unpivot. So in this case, it's the numbers. So um, so I can select this with um, six to the end. So. This is it. So 1990 to 2011. So this is basically. Um, so actually, if you just run it like this, it will work. But it's just a better practice to define all the arguments. So value bars here. And what happens now is that we went from this white format that we have. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is very common in Excel. People have data like this, and but in, for data analysis, it's not very useful. So, um, so the F melted. So, yeah, you can just define it like this. And there are some other things you can change here. So instead of calling this variable, we can just call it year. So there's an argument for that. So bar name. And let's see, bar name here. And yeah, this value, we don't have any other, a better name for that. So we can leave it like that. But basically, this is a good example, a kind of real world-ish data that you can, you can really find this very often. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot better than the examples that I've kind of found around. So 
One more thing that I want to show you is how you can reshape data. And this is um, using the multi-index uh, syntax in Panda. So in these examples, I'll be using stack and stack and pivot. So here we have some dummy data. So we have a date, a variable, and some value. The pivot, what it does, it converts this format that's long, it converts it to wide format. So in general, for data analysis, you would prefer this kind of format. But in some cases, this is useful. As, as we saw in the stocks data, it was kind of in this format. So in some cases, it's better. Um, but basically, nothing is changing in terms of the data here. So we're not doing any aggregation. We're just moving the, the, the values around. So we just move this, this variable column into created new columns with it. Okay. So, but the, there, there wasn't any aggregation. We didn't compute the mean or counted anything. So that's what df.pivot does. So then what is stack and unstack? So we have this uh, example data here. So what is stacked? What does it mean? So if I grab this data frame and I do dot stack, what happens is that this uh, columns index is put on the rows. So we're kind of moving these, uh, the columns, we're moving them to the rows. Okay, so maybe I call to frame to make it easier to see. Um, basically just moving this to here. Okay. Um, so this is stacked. So if I do unstack, what happens? So it go back, goes back to how it was initially here. Okay. So I can, so this is the default, right? So if I do unstack zero, um, what happens is that the, this bar bus goes to the columns. So, in, in the default version, the, the um, yeah, this, the ABC, so AB, 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 that's what gets moved. So it's the index that's kind of on the nearest to the columns. And here I, I pass the index zero. So we go from this uh, data. Um, so let me delete this. Um, so we go from this data uh, where we grab this zero index and put it as a column okay and if i pass one so let me put it here um so if i do one what will happen is this will be moved to the columns okay so basically it's something that you would kind of do in excel like manually here but in in pandas you have to program it you have to tell the data frame how do you want the columns to be moved around and you should imagine that combining pivot um, and stack and unstack you can pretty much do any type of data manipulation um, but i found that the, the syntax of melt that i show you here once you get used to it it's very intuitive so you just define the id columns that you want you define the columns that are values and mm, that's basically it so that solves one problem that's going from wide to long format right so here i'm here we're so we find it as a section so the other problem is when you have uh when you have data in a long format and for some reason you want it to be wide or have to reshape it a little bit so that's when um stack and unstack are useful okay so here we have data in a kind of long format and with unstuck, I can kind of pivot it back. Okay. And, and I think the, the documentation of, of this, uh, very good. Um, so reshaping. Okay. So they, they give a lot of examples with, uh, yeah, with these drawings that make it a lot more intuitive. So maybe this part, I, I didn't find that, uh, interesting but um yeah here here they explain how you can go from this kind of long format so you see that the a b a b a b values are moved to the columns and then if you do unstuck you define the index one so this is basically this index so that's get goes to the 
to the columns. And stack zero is uh, yeah the first index, so bar and pass, so they go to the columns. And that's basically it for this section. I mean, this is this is not easy and it's a little bit confusing and we we generally get to this point and we just need to google how to do this but um but yeah i think it's it's good to have some idea how you can approach it okay so that's it for this tutorial we covered a lot of concepts so we started with reading some data then we worked on simple operations selecting column filtering rows sorting a data frame um, then we worked on updating columns. Uh, here we used assign method. That's a very popular method today. Then we worked uh, with some value counts and group by. So also very common operation. Then I covered some examples with time series data. We did some plotting. And finally, we did some reshaping. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And please subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed it.